Well, welcome back and hope you're feeling uh, satisfied having finished the book of Galatians and now we're moving into the book of Ephesians. You're making great progress here. Uh, we are making our way from Romans to Revelation. Uh, should be done, as I said, I think in October and uh, be just so rewarding. I'm sure the Lord will use his word in your life. He promises that his word is going to accomplish the uh, goals he sends it out for and the life of the believer, it's to mature us and to make us more like Christ. So I'm certain he's going to do that, and he is doing that for you. So today we're looking at the book of Ephesians. Um, give you kind of an overview in a couple different ways you can outline the book. Um, on the one hand, we can look at it as a, ch a book about the blessings of the church. Um, chapter 1, we can title that, The Blessings of the Church. Chapter 2 and 3, Understanding the Blessings. And then chapters 4 through 6, we could call that uh, walking in the blessing or living out the blessing. Another way uh, people have um, uh, divided up the book, uh, tried to outline it, is uh, the um, uh, chapters 1 through 3 are the position of the Christian, your and I's position in Christ, our position in the church, and then 4 through 6 is our practice, is our practice. Paul spent quite a lot of time at this church. Uh, I think the longest uh, that we know of at any church that he stayed at was in the church of Ephesus. Uh, if you look in the book of Acts, uh, he uh, visited Ephesus on his second missionary journey right toward the end. That's in chapters 15 through 18 of the book of Acts. And then his third missionary journey is in Acts 18 through 21. Paul spent two years uh, teaching uh, in Ephesus and had quite a bit of impact there. Um, once we get through the book of Ephesians and we move on, we'll get into what's called the prison epistles. Uh, these are understood to have been written while Paul was in his Roman first Roman imprisonment at the end of the book of Acts. And um, this imprisonment then was, this, the letters were written to churches in the Lycus Valley, Philippians and um, Colossians, the letter to Philemon, um, all associated with churches that are in the area of Ephesus that were planted by men like Epaphras, who uh, went out from Ephesus and planted the church, started the church in their particular city. So this is the relationship of these books. Uh, chapter 1, as I said, is... Uh, really a lot about the blessings of the church and Paul's prayer for the church. So that would be two big sections here. Uh, verses 1 through 14 is the blessings, 15 through the end of the chapter. You could look at Paul's prayers. So as you go through this today, um, I ask you to uh, pay close attention. You might want to get a piece of paper and a pencil and write down I've counted nine blessings that Paul talks about. Maybe you'll have more or less, um, but I have nine blessings. Let me just walk through those a little bit with you so you can be alert for them as you're reading today. Uh, in verse 3, uh, Paul says that we've been blessed, this is the church, with every spiritual blessing. It's hard to believe sometimes, but uh, at the moment of our um, salvation, uh, given to us is everything that is in Christ for us. It's nothing more that we need to earn, nothing that we need to merit. Christ has earned and merited everything, and by our faith in him, it's imputed to us. Uh, one theologian has listed 33 different blessings that are ours at the moment of salvation. Of course, when we're new believers, we don't uh, understand all of that. We don't appreciate those. We don't appropriate those, but as we grow in the Lord, we come to know more and more uh, the blessings that are ours in Him. And Paul's going to list some of those here. Verse 4, he says, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Well, this, this becomes a stumbling block for a lot of people. Uh, how can God do that? On what basis does He do it? Uh, Paul says that He does it according to, the, uh, according to His will, was His choice. Um, what we're to do is believe it, right? Not explain it, uh, not understand it, but believe it. That before the foundation of the world, before you and I took a breath, 
or our parents took a breath or our grandparents or our great great grandparents or before Genesis 1 God chose us verse 5 he predestined us another stumbling block for people some look at this and say uh, predestined means uh, God looked down the uh, corridors of history saw what we would do and because we were going to believe he destined us for adoption it's not what the word means I invite you to do a word study uh, particularly in the uh, the Old Testament usage the same word but it means that he destined us beforehand he predestined us that he intended us uh, when he chose us he predestined us to be adopted into his family and he blessed us by grace in his son verse 6 his grace was be, be the um, our election or perhaps the blessing of salvation verse 7 is redemption through the blood of Jesus which is explained further as the forgiveness of sins redemption is one of those uh, um, theological concepts that it would be great uh, for you to master uh, get a dictionary or look online in a Bible study uh, program or things that are online and read about redemption and all that's involved with that we've been purchased by Christ purchased by his blood bought back from being um, under the reign and rule of Satan through the forgiveness of our sins verse 9 says we're, we know the mystery of God's will it's been made known to us Paul will explain later in Ephesians that that mystery is the church church is never mentioned in the Old Testament it's never talked about uh, we don't know anything about the church until Acts chapter 2 uh, where the church is born and it's a mystery that not revealed before but it's been revealed to us and brothers and sisters we have the privilege today of knowing that mystery of the church and knowing about it verse 11 uh, he talks about an inheritance and he's going to come back to that in verse 13 uh, verse 11 to predestination predestined to be to the praise of his glory I take this to mean that we've been predestined to be glorifying and praising God forever in heaven. Uh, God is going to uh, gather uh, worshipers around him. That's what he's doing now through the church. He's gathering worshipers from every tongue and tribe and nation around the world and incorporating them into the church. Um, there's a beautiful picture in Zephaniah chapter 3 of the uh, um, gathered saints praising God in the last days in heaven and what is God doing in response he is singing he is the only place that God is said to be singing I think it's in Zephaniah 3 16 or 17 you could look that up but uh, God is said to be singing verse 13 our ninth blessing sealed with the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our inheritance I think this inheritance that he's talking about is eternal life this is the inheritance that's been given to us. The Holy Spirit guarantees it at the moment of salvation. Uh, he is going to be with you. He's going to ensure that you persevere in your salvation, uh, that you uh, never fall away, that uh, all that God has given to the Son, uh, the Son is going to keep by the power of the Holy Spirit, and He's going to raise us all up at the last day. That's our inheritance that's coming. And the Spirit has sealed that to us. A good illustration I was told one time was um, in a Greek marketplace, you could buy a, a vase, and on the bottom of the vase you turn it over, and it was stamped with an A, indicating it was authentic. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, at the moment of salvation, we are baptized by the Spirit into Christ. He is, as Paul says, seals us. We're sealed in that union with Christ. And uh, we are authentic. The Holy Spirit authenticates us. We may have ups and downs in our Christian walk. Paul's going to talk about that in Ephesians 4 through 6. Uh, but no matter what, uh, we are going to be persevering to the end. And the Holy Spirit is going to present us uh, before the Lord on the last day. We go into verse 17 then, or start that second paragraph beginning in verse 15. Uh, or third paragraph, Paul talks about the um, prayer that he has for the Ephesians. In light of all the blessings they have, in light of all the things that God has done for them, 
Paul prays for them. Let me ask you, do you pray for other churches? Do you take time to pray for the churches in your community? It's easy to pray for people we know, uh, maybe even a pastor that we know. But I'd encourage you and invite you as maybe an application of this chapter to take some time to pray for the churches that are in your community. Paul prays that uh, the church in Ephesus may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And look at that in the knowledge of God, of him, the knowledge of God. That's the sphere of this wisdom and revelation. I think Paul is not praying that they would receive brand new revelation unless that came to them through an apostle like him, unless that came to them through the written word of God, that he is praying that they would have insight and understanding to all these spiritual blessings that he's, go, that he's told them about and that he's going to explain to them in the next chapters. He wants them to know the hope to which they've been called. Um, this is interesting. Um, I think he's praying for more than just uh, be able to list it in a list like we did today, to know that one of our hopes is eternal life. One of our hopes is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Paul wants them to know that deep down inside and live by it. We call that appropriation, that we take a truth of the Bible and we appropriate it and live by it in our lives. I think that's what Paul is praying for here, that we live today in light of his glorious appearing, that we live today in light of the fact that we are going to be raised from the dead. We have no fear as it says in Ephesians 2.14, that the devil has no control over us because the only control he has is the threat of death. And that threat has been taken away. He's been disarmed. And we are to live in that truth, appropriate that truth. And finally, uh, Paul prays that they know the greatness of his power toward them. And again, I think he's praying not that they would just be aware of it, but that they would know it, appropriate it, and experience it. As I said in the book of Galatians, that the way that you um, experience these things is you persevere, uh, particularly when they're suffering, uh, that God will deliver you from that suffering or he'll see you through it. But either way, whether it's uh, perseverance until deliverance or per perseverance to your death, God is uh, glorified and God is honored and his power is working through you. You know, um, we find ourselves often praying for the sick, um, especially as we age. Uh, lots of our friends uh, fall in diseases and illnesses and injuries and aches and pains and sickness. And certainly we want to pray for the Lord to heal them. Uh, I'm a firm believer uh, that the Lord can and does heal people even today. Uh, but uh, I think we could also pray uh, not only for their deliverance, but if the Lord chooses in his sovereignty to allow them to suffer, that they suffer in a way that glorifies the Lord. Let me invite you to not only pray for other churches, but pray for your friends to not only be delivered, but to also suffer well. So, applications here. Let's reflect on these blessings that we have. Really make them our own. Thank God for these things. Think about them deeply. Take some quiet time, maybe this morning, um, maybe tomorrow before your devotional, uh, to just think through these things and the implications of what they, what they uh, provide you. And then Pray that you grow in the understanding of these blessings and pray that you grow in the appropriation of them. Paul's going to talk about these things in the rest of the book of uh, Ephesians and really in the rest of the New Testament, we're going to learn more and more. So pray that the Lord would illuminate your heart and illuminate your mind. So God bless you, brothers and sisters.